Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Prabhat Patnaik and we'll be discussing the state of the Indian economy, particularly as we are now in the run-up to the state of the economy document itself, which the government, central government presents, and of course the budget. Prabhat, looking at the last two, two and a half years, and I think that's the really the crux of what's been happening, we have seen a sharp drop, dip in the economy, particularly because of the pandemic. But we had little some rise, and again we have again a situation where again, but the pandemic is here, and uh, the Omicron has taken its toll on the economy. So, looking at all of this, how do you look at the impact it has had, particularly on the working people, because it also seems to have had a very differential impact. We have had uh, really rise of the stock of the stocks. We have had rise of the uh, big capital in the country, their, their wealth seems to have grown. And also we have a number of what are called unicorns who have apparently got a huge amount of money from the stock market uh, or the capital market, something like $24 billion. So how do you see this, this level of growth of the rich as opposed to the drop in the income of the poor? You see, even before the Omicron crisis hit us, there is no doubt that the recovery that was occurring in the economy was completely uh, stunted. As a matter of fact, some people talk about a K-shaped recovery, which basically means that you come up to a certain level, then you go down again. And the reason for that is very clear, namely that during the pandemic, large numbers of households, particularly working people, how, people households, they got into debt. They got into debt because they were left without any income. They were left without any accommodation and so on. So to maintain their existence itself, they had to borrow. Now, when you do that, then when you do get some income, then your priority is to pay off your loans. As a result, the multiplier impact of whatever the government spends or whatever investment occurs in the economy is something that is incomplete. You know, in, in, in other words, the multiplier impact itself is actually stunted. Now, when that happens, then you do have a certain amount of investment, but consumption does not come up pari passu exactly to a corresponding level. And when that happens, then investment itself tends to slow down. So, so you have this peculiar situation where in any case, even before the Omicron, this was clearly visible. Uh, people kept talking about how high the growth rate was, but forgetting that it was high from a point where it already had gone down substantially. Even now, the most optimistic estimates, which of course now have all been scaled down because of the pandemic, the most optimistic estimates basically suggested that the economy would come up at the most to the same level where it was in 2019-20. It had gone down and, and now it's coming up. And the idea was that even if you take, for instance, the estimate which was made by the State Bank of India, the 9%, 9.5% growth rate in, in, in this year, 1921-22, uh, it would have really more or less brought it up to the same level where it was in 2019-20. But now everybody is scaling it down even further. Even if they hadn't scaled it down, that earlier bringing up to the 2019-20 level could not have been sustained because investment would have fallen. You see, nobody adds to capacity if the output that is produced from that capacity is no higher than what it was in 2019-20, since when there have been some additions to capacity. So unutilized capacity would have been much higher today with the same level of output as two, two, two years ago. And therefore, investment plans would have been reduced. And so you would have had a situation where the growth could not have been sustained. That's the case. But now with the Omicron, of course, it's, it's added to that whole business, that whole problem. So when you talk about the recovery not taking place and the K-shaped recovery, but it has affected the poor and the rich very differently. So you do see that, for instance, Mr. Ambani's wealth has increased significantly. So have others who have gained even during the depression that we have had for the last two years. And you also see that, for instance, a huge amount of liquid money being really 
uh, what shall we say, grabbed or uh, siphoned off or entering what are called the unicorns, which are really taking advantage of the fact that you have uh, stay at home for a large number of people. You have edutech sectors, you have other sectors which are uh, you know, distributing goods or foodstuffs during the pandemic. So a lot of the fact that you have different kinds of lockdowns, we also have this effect that rich have actually in terms got richer at the time the poor have uh, poor the income of the poor have actually dropped yes, I, I, absolutely absolutely income as well as wealth of the rich has actually increased quite substantially during this pandemic while the poor have actually become much worse off and that is precisely what is going to affect the economy because if you look at the figures that for instance were made available about the previous quarter you found that the consumption goods sector was the one which was really had not come up you see even when i said that it would have come up to the 2019-20 level, the consumption goods sector would not have come up. In fact, these were basically carryover investment projects and consumption goods sectors would not have come up precisely because the poor are the main consumers. You see, they are the ones who actually buy the bulk of the consumer goods. Mr. Ambani's or Adani's consumption is hardly something which is a driving force for the economy. As a result, you know, I mean, something which, by the way, the government does not understand and the government has actually been pursuing during a fiscal policy, which is quite perverse in handing over money to the Ambani's and the Adani's uh, in the belief that that's going to stimulate the economy. The economy gets stimulated only when there's purchasing power in the hands of the poor. And it is this which really has gone down. So that is the in terms of the economy, simple horse sense in the economy would be give consumption the ability to consume uh, in the hands of the people, give them money which they can then use for consumption. That is one. And secondly, that if that does not happen, we'll see neither the economy expanding nor the people, the bulk of our people in that sense, being able to even keep up to the standards they had before the pandemic. So this is one uh, part of the story. The other part of the story is that if we look at the central government, the role of the central government in, in terms of its own fiscal policy, where it's going to, it's getting the money for the, the, the whatever yearly expenditure it incurs. Now that is, we are seeing also at the expense of the state governments because a large part of it seems to come from essentially uh, stress which is put on the oil sector, which doesn't get to the states because that's not redistributed in the, in the way that other uh, taxes are. So do you think there is also an element in this particular sets of policies that taking advantage or during the pandemic to put the burden not only on the poor, but also on the state governments? Oh, absolutely. In fact, this burden is put in two ways. One, as you mentioned, is the fact that those commodities from which the taxes are being raised by the central government are, 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 are commodities whose revenue is not shareable with the states. The second is that even the due that should be made available to the states, like GST compensation, is just not being paid to the states. You see, because, because that was a promise which was made on the basis of which many of the state governments agreed to forego the taxes they were having earlier, which constitutionally had been given to them, but they decided to forego it on the presumption that for five years they are going to be paid GST compensation. But the central government, having got the states to agree to GST by making this promise, now is reneging on this promise. So in both ways, by denying them resources which in any case should have come to them, and what is more, by using revenue sources which are not shareable, the central government is really squeezing the states. And additionally, you see what happens is that basically we are in the midst of an agrarian crisis. We are in the midst, of course, of... Uh, an epidemic, for both of which you find that, that the state governments are required at this very time to undertake larger expenditures. Because after all, if, 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 
If the pandemic has to be managed, the state governments have to, uh, have to spend more. If the agrarian crisis is to be managed, then of course the state government has to spend more. And precisely when the expenditure responsibilities of the state government are going up, they are being squeezed of resources is something which is hurting state government finances immensely. And you see the center also has been pursuing a, a, a sort of perverse fiscal policy where what they do is that they, they have been giving tax concessions to the Ambani's and to the rich generally. The wealth tax was abolished, finally abolished in 2016. Now it's true it was not giving much revenue, but it was simply done away with in 2016, while now you find everybody, including in the Davos summit, even billionaires saying you must tax us more. But, but but that's not what the, the government actually did away with wealth tax. Additionally, in 2019, it actually brought down the corporate tax rate from 30% to 22%. Now, the revenue loss on account of all this is sought to be made up by precisely increasing indirect taxation on the poor through things like oil price hike and so on. Now, when you do that, you have a number of things simultaneously occurring. One, of course, is that this kind of a substitution can very rarely give you the a reduction or, 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 or even the old fiscal deficit that you wish to maintain. I mean, if you, if you give away 100 rupees of tax concessions to the rich and you wish to raise 100 rupees through indirect taxes from the poor, then in the process of raising those 100 rupees of indirect taxes, you have to raise prices. That's precisely the way indirect taxes operate. So you stimulate inflation. When you stimulate inflation, since the purchasing power in the hands of the working people is not growing, therefore what happens is a recession. So you have an inflationary recession like you're having today. And at the same time, because of the recession, you don't even get as much revenue as you had originally thought you were going to get, because of which even your fiscal deficit widens. So all the phenomena that you find in today's economy, a wide fiscal deficit, uh, a recession, and inflation, all of it is linked to this perverse fiscal stance which the government has of actually taking purchasing power away from the people and put, putting purchasing power in the hands of the rich through corporate tax concessions. As you said, the rich unfortunately do not consume, uh, at least in large amounts, and therefore, the bulk of the people, if they're robbed of their purchasing power, it means you are, of course, going towards a, diff, you know, a recession. And that's exactly what you see, what you said, inflation combined with recession, which is really, a, for any economy, it's about the worst case scenario. In, in, in fact, very few economies in the world are at this moment pursuing such a policy of actually shifting the tax burden from the rich to the poor. You look at Biden, for instance, you know, I mean, precisely at a time when Biden was trying to get agreement on an internationally agreed corporate tax rate, Indian government was lowering the corporate tax to 22%. Biden's original proposal to, was to have a much higher tax rate, but eventually they settled at, at, at a lower, at about 15%, but including all the tax havens and so on. So, so the point is that, you know, that, that this is not what any major capitalist government at this moment is even thinking about. What explains this perverse policy of this government? Do you think it's just an a, a ignorance about the econo economic, uh, economics? Uh, or is it ideal, ideology is such that refuse to see the facts that are in front of them? You know, ob the one obvious reason, of course, is a kind of cronyism. And the cronyism is fairly bloody-minded when you're actually bent upon giving concessions to your cronies and making up for it by squeezing the poor. Uh, it's, but that minded cronyism certainly is there. It's, it's an important uh, consideration perhaps in the government's mind, but the way they justify it 
generally to the public is that giving more money to the capitalists would enable them to invest more. Now, capitalists don't invest more if they have more money. They invest more if the demand is growing, if the market is growing, if, 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 if there's no recession. Now, in the midst of a recession, if you actually ask a capitalist to invest, you'd be stupid to do it. And, and this is why investment itself would be sustained precisely by doing all these things which are supposed to uh, uh, make them invest. So, Prabhat, if you were in the government, you were an advisor, uh, what would you have advised at this moment differently than what the government is doing? You know, the, 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 the first thing I would suggest is either to have a wealth tax or to raise the corporate income tax to tax the capitalists. And this is what the capitalists themselves <laughs> are saying. You know, at, at, at Davos, many of them actually said that you please tax us more and use it for education and health expenditure, which is required for the poor. And that's a minimum, which a, 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 a government concerned about the economy, concerned about the people and the poor should be doing. And I think that would be my starting point that either a wealth tax or a corporate tax hike is something which is essential to raise revenue. And then you use that revenue. Uh, earlier, we used to talk about transfers to the poor, but now one can even think of larger expenditure. We're talking about a budget. We're not talking about an immediate kind of relief measure. Uh, uh, spend more on education, on health, and things of that kind, uh, where expenditure is a proportion of GDP, if anything has marginally gone down in the last few years, last couple of years, even earlier, it was at a, an abysmally low but constant level. And as a result, this is something which is which 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 comes in the way of the constitutional obligation of the country to provide equality of opportunity. That if you have a poor kid who can't go to school because the government is not spending enough on, on, on building schools, uh, or a poor kid who can't go to a hospital because not enough hospitals are available, then that is a disgrace. So, so basically, I would suggest that tax the rich and use the proceeds for spending on things like education, health, and other such avenues. For those who are following the discourse of the Prime Minister, he has said recently that we should think about our duties as citizens, not talk about our rights, at a time when the children of our country are not able to access education. With two, for the last two years, what we are hearing is their education has taken such a hit, most of them haven't really learned much. You have also increasingly a gap between what is the requisite amount of food a child needs to have, malnutrition has actually grown, and for various other things, all of it of which is the right they have. It's not a duty that they have to do. It's a right the state has as its duty to it towards its citizens. Now, I think the government needs to really think about all of this. But given the past budgets, given the kind of uh, statements we hear from our leadership in the government, I don't think we are going to see a, a significant change in the way the budget is going to be framed. Looks like we'll have more of the same. Let's hope it won't, but not much optimism on that count. With that, we close our discussion with Professor Prabhat, Prabhat Patnaik. Prabhat, thank you for being with us, and we'll be in touch with you for more discussions, particularly as this is the budget season.